Should be on. Cool. Um, well, thanks for coming here. We've got uh, next up uh, another local, Peter Billen. He's here to talk about uh, all things MIDI. Uh, so he's been doing it for many, many years, basically based on the bio. You can go back to the 70s where he quit, uh, quit his PhD and started playing guitar and then uh, he's been making MIDI stuff ever since. So I'll hand over the floor to him and uh, teach us about much MIDI and its lessons. Yeah. Thank you. Is that, that yeah, that's coming through. <clears throat> okay, just got to find page one. Here we go. Greetings. Um, I'm Peter Billum. The website is pjb.com.au. Um, I have a particular place in the ecology of open source development, sort of out on the lone wolf fringe. I write things because I need them, and I write them by myself because they were small enough to write by myself, and then I use them because I needed them, and I maintain them because I use them. So it's, it's very self-contained, and it sort of all fits together. It has advantages and disadvantages gives a lot of agility and flexibility. For example, I can decide whether it's a, when it's appropriate to add features or to break backward compatibility without having to wade through any net political process. It's fast. Um, on the other hand, it limits size and complexity. And it also constrains the longevity, because when I stop paying the bills, it's not guaranteed that anyone's going to take take it over, and if they do, the code and its background and its context will be unfamiliar to them. But that's the, um, that's the place, it shouldn't do that. Okay. Um, that was way in ahead of what it what it's supposed to be. Isn't it? What's happened to my, oh no. What's happened to my slides? What's happened to my slides? This is more like it. That was strange that it jumped, jumped about 10 slides. Here we go, MIDI. MIDI is a standard agreed on in 1983 by an association of hardware manufacturers like Roland and Sony and Kurzweil and people like that. Um, they probably never dreamed that open source programmers would ever write anything relevant to it. The standard offers, so it allows you to plug in your MIDI keyboard into your synthesizer and all sorts of other gear, and it offers 16 channels, virtual channels, which go down the same wire, and each channel can be given a given, set to a given patch, um, which is an instrumental sound, like a clarinet or a sine wave or um, a piano, or whatever. And each channel can be controlled by about 60 or 70 controllers that control things like pedal up or down, or the tone control, the volume, pan, reverb, all, all that stuff. MIDI exists, MIDI information exists in two forms. Primary is it exists in real time. So when I play a note on MIDI, my MIDI keyboard, a MIDI event goes down the wire, a particular channel, um, and it's in real time. There's no timing information necessary. The time is now, um, and the synthesizer has to perform that event uh, now. Of course, there's no such thing as now, because of the speed of light, not to mention the speed of sound. And there will be some latency, and about 10 milliseconds total latency is acceptable. Of the Linux software synths, um, Timidity does not meet that. It's not usable for live um, performance, in my experience. Fluid synth just meets it on a fast CPU. Um, so that, that's OK. The second form is that it can be stored in files, in MIDI files, dot .mid. These files have to include their timing information. So it's, it's different format. Same information, but different format. Each MIDI event has a delta time since the previous event, the incremental time, and it's measured not in anything normal, but in ticks. And the tick, you define yourself in the file in beats. And the beats, at last, you define in microseconds. 
I mostly use um, one tick equals a millisecond. But typically, MIDI files will have different tick rates, which makes them very hard to merge together. So I, most of my software tends to um, normalize everything to a millisecond tick and then work out what to do with it afterwards. Because MIDI exists in real-time real form and file form, um, you have to be able to convert between the two forms. So converting from real-time to file is called recording. And in Linux, that's done with a program called a record MIDI. Yes, work this time. Hmm. Um, so this example um, sets 60 beats to the minute, 1,000 ticks to the uh, second, and records from my Pro Keys 88, which is a 88-note uh, um, keyboard from M Audio. A case-sensitive beginning of word match is enough. There's no um, uh, tab completion here, so it's just as well that you don't have to wipe pro keys, um, uh, whatever it is, um, 88 uh, return every time, and then, f then escape the, the, the space afterwards. Um, and it puts the result in f.mid. And converting from file to real time is called playing. Um, and in Linux, that's done with a play MIDI. So this um, a play MIDI to the timidity um, minus p means port. It doesn't matter, but, um, and it uh, plays the file f dot mid, and then you hear it through your timidity synthesizer. You can also convert it to um, audio, an audio file, because audio also exists in real time and form and in file form, um, using timidity or. Uh, Fluidity is my um, front end for uh, the fluid synth um, library. Uh, and this, in timidity, it's minus output in WAV format. Minus O is the um, G dot WAV. As if it made any sense to run the thing without an output file. Why, why do they? Anyway. And then uh, this is the file it works on. Fluidity is easier. Fluidity G dot mid to G dot WAV, and that's it. I won't spend any time on the last example, but it, it's profound because it shows how MIDI controllers, like the pedal attached to my um, keyboard here, um, can be used to control audio processing, not just a MIDI synthesizer, using Echo Sound, which has this wonderful option, minus KM. Um, here, controller 74 on channel 15 um, regulates the first parameter of the previous um, command, which is a filter. It's just a, um, a bell-shaped bell filter, which defaults to 400 hertz. And the controller varies it between 250 and 990 hertz. And in other words, it's a wah-wah pedal. So you can wah-wah your audio um, using MIDI commands, which can govern um, audio processing. It can be useful. I don't use it as much as I thought I would. But, um, okay. I program in Yes, that's right. I program in Perl, Python, and Lua. Um, and there's lots of modules that manipulate MIDI files. Uh, they all descend from Sean Burke's CPAN module, which has been running for decades and never gets anything wrong. Um, but I do find that the API is a bit cumbersome. But I translated the core code into uh, Python uh, to get midi.py. There's dozens of modules, unfortunately, called midi.py. Um, it's not in PyPI because of a naming conflict up to case with a module they already have. So you have to get it from www.pjb.com.au. And this I then translated into Lua um, to get midi.lua. Fortunately, I was the first. And this is very uh, uh, API compatible with the Python module and is available as a Lua rocks. So just Lua rocks install midi, bang, it's there. Um, that's sort of file infrastructure on Linux. Um, the 
real-time MIDI infrastructure on Linux has been through several generations. Originally, um, OSS, which just breaks the MIDI keyboard or the MIDI synthesizer out into the file system. Uh, it appears as a file in <coughs> drum solo. Uh, it appears as a file system in slash dev slash SND and file system as a file in slash dev slash SND when you plug it in. That's all. It's just like a cable. It only works in real time. It only handles hardware clients and um, it provides no timing code. Uh, everything is real time, so you every application has to write its own timing code. Also, the device file names bear no relation to the device they represent, and it's quite hard to work out what's going on. Um, but it's a bootstrap. It, it gets, gets it off the ground. Alsa MIDI was a huge step forward. The clients have sensible names, um, and you can cr create your own software clients. You can list the clients with a connect minus OIL. There you go. Um, and it provides you with timing code and queuing so that you can give it an event whenever it's convenient for your program to give a, get rid of this event now with an instruction, you know, play it in 17 milliseconds or whatever. And the ALSA MIDI will take care of the queuing that event and transmitting it at the right time. It's very easy to see what's there, a connect minus OIL, so output input list. Um, and to connect one client to another, this connects the pro keys to timidity. Um, could hardly be simpler. On a single host, there's nothing more really that you could want with um, MIDI real-time infrastructure. And because I only work on one host, Alsa MIDI is all I ever use. The next step is Jack MIDI. which allow <coughs> allows you to connect a client on one host to a client on another with good low latency because it uses the kernel. So if you're running a whole electronic mu music studio with several boxes, um, Jack MIDI is what you need. <coughs> As for software infrastructure, the ALSA MIDI C interface is confusing and for years, um, I was longing for a high-level language module for real-time MIDI. And the logjam was broken when I discovered Patricio Payeth AlsaSec um, module, um, which has working C code and, uh, and a pretty good API. So this I translated into my MIDI AlsaSec um, CPAN module, which is almost completely API compatible but it has a couple of extra functions and a couple of bug fixes. Um, and I then translated that into my MIDI Alsa.lua module, which is totally a, a API compatible with the, um, the Perl one and is available as a Lua rock. So just Lua rocks um, install MIDI, MIDI Alsa. <coughs> but there's more to life than infrastructure. Um, so, and I wrote these modules because I wanted the modules to write um, apps using them. So now it's time to look at the website screen dump. Um, this is the front page. The top section is my music, uh, which is not relevant here. But do check it out if you can read music. And if you have any friends that can read music, let them know about it too. Um, the middle section has two links. The top one is to uh, MuseScript, which is my music typesetting software, which strategically it lies between ABC and Lily Pond. So it has most of the flexibility, most of the power of um, Lily Pond, exaggerating somewhat, and most of the ease of use of ABC. Um, it's, it's all I ever use, and I use it all day, every day. Um, Check out the changes uh, if you uh, type, type through to MuseScript. Um, the link here takes you to the MIDI page, which is hopefully, yes. Um, 
I use all this stuff pretty much every day. And if there are any bugs, I'm usually the first to notice. Um, at least 90% of the time, I'm the first to notice the bugs. Um, so using your own stuff, it, you get quality from it, you know. I actually get more of a thrill from fixing a bug than I do from um, adding a feature because you, just, you can just feel the, the quality um, improving uh, under your fingers. It, I, th I find that very satisfying. Um, today I'm going to talk about a couple of apps which manipulate MIDI files and a couple which manipulate MIDI in real time. Um, so the, I'm going to talk about MIDI socks. It's alphabetical. Here we go. And MIDI edit, which manipulate, real, man, manipulate files. And then about MIDI loop and MIDI chord, which manipulate real time MIDI. And if th there should be time for a little demo of MIDI edits, but the MIDI loop demo um, has been cut from the program. Um, socks. Who's heard of socks? Good, okay, SOCKS, as you may well know, um, is a well-established tool for processing audio files. It does things like mix them or concatenate them, change the tempo or the key. It does tone controls, compressor, can pad the beginning or the end with silence, trim bits off, fade in, fade out, all sorts of other effects. It can do other stuff too. But all those examples you could also do to a MIDI file. So I wrote MIDI SOCKS to be as far as possible command line compatible with SOX. So in the, in the first example, SOX merges, that's minus M, um, the um, recordings of the bass, B.WAV, and the horns, H.WAV, increasing the volume of the horns by 1.2, and puts the result in out.WAV after having trimmed off four seconds from the beginning, then faded in through two seconds, then with the total length of 60 seconds faded out during the last three of those, and then it pads the beginning with 2.5 seconds. <coughs> and once you've done that, you can play um, out.wav, and it comes out, the, comes out the speakers. And the second example is the MIDI SOX equivalent. Um, so it merges uh, the, a MIDI file, which is your bass line, um, and the um, horns, we're increasing the volume of the horns, puts the result in out.mid, um, and trims and fades and pads the beginning, just exactly as in socks. Uh, it's highly API compatible, highly option compatible. And that, I wish there was more of it. Um, and that's a theme I'll, I'll, I'll come back to. And uh, the bottom is the, is the manual. That's what um, it links to when you um, that's only a screen dump, so I can't scroll down it. Um, and all, all my manual pages you'll see uh, kind of in this format. Oh, yeah, sure, B Backspace. Um, MIDI Socks was first written in Python to road test my MIDI.py module, <coughs> which is why I wrote the MIDI.py module. So then I translated it into Lua to road test my MIDI.Lua module. So because I'd already done two of them, I then translated it into Perl to road test some um, wrapping routines which I'd put over um, the uh, CPAN modules API to make it uh, more usable, at least for me. And I maintain MIDI socks in all three languages, and they all work and they uh, give the same results. <coughs> I have to say, that the Lua version runs about twice as fast as the Python and Perl versions, which run almost exactly the same speed. It's not usually an issue because MIDI files are compact. Um, but it's one of the reasons why Lua is currently my most fashionable language. <coughs> also, now about MIDI edit. Um, MIDI, before MIDI edit, the state of art in editing MIDI files was to dump the data in some ASCII format, which is quite easy to do, and then edit the ASCII with your favorite text editor, and then convert it back into um, a MIDI file. Uh, MIDI 
edit started like that, and it still offers that with the minus D option. So we'll just have a quick look at the contents of a MIDI file, slow machine, and, and it's all, all there in gruesome detail. And you, so you can edit, edit one of these numbers, like this, <coughs> this number would change the um, controller not <coughs> 91 on channel 8, and you can edit 118 a uh, to a different value, and that's it. The problem with this uh, is that um, when you start to get to the notes, the note on event is a separate event from the note off event. So if you want to delete a note, you've got to find the corresponding note off to the note on you've just deleted, otherwise you have a weird MIDI file and it's bound to cause problems sometime. And sometimes that's easy relatively, sometimes it's a real chore. Um, but those are, tip, those are MIDI, MIDI events. <coughs> so that was the state of the art before MIDI edit. Um, <coughs> MIDI edit itself creates an ALSA MIDI client. You also, you can't hear what you're, what you're editing. So MIDI, um, MIDI edit um, by default is now a curses app where the UI borrows keystrokes from. Um, no, it should be faster to start up than that, by the way. Um, borrows keystrokes from Vi and from M Player. Um, <coughs> and we'll go through some of those keystrokes for moving around. So you move up and down with um, the arrow key. Couldn't be more obvious. Um, or following M player, um, a right arrow takes you one second down. You can see we're at 154, mi everything's milliseconds here. 154 milliseconds, so a right arrow <coughs> takes you one second down. And someone's just played a, um, a, a hi hat on the, uh, with a stick. And likewise, um, left arrow, this following end player takes you one second back again. So, back, so we're back to 154. And f like end player, page down takes you down 10, well, in end player it takes you down a minute. Um, uh, here it takes you down 10 seconds because DVDs are typically longer than um, MIDI files. Um, 10 seconds is what you need, so that takes us to, um, 10 seconds and 154, one and likewise page up. <coughs> likewise, um, page home, if I can find the, here we go, takes you to the top, and end takes you to the end, exactly as you would expect. Um, you can also move around um, with um, find. You can find an event like slash, so slash M finds a marker, that's what we'll do. Or you can slash <coughs> T to find the time signature. And um, This is a special case. Um, slash S, it doesn't matter. Um, slash P um, changes a patch change and so on. So we'll find a marker, which is M. So that can be typed at full keyboard speed. I mean, he, here I'm pausing just because there's help at the bottom. Don't care about the text. And that's the first marker. Um, that's the beginning of the main section. As in Vi, N takes you to the next marker. And uppercase N takes you to the um, previous um, marker. And um, yes, uh, I think that's right. So this is the third marker in the file. It's the beginning of the main riff. The other main way of principal way of getting through a MIDI file is, of course, to play it. And like M player, it's pause and um, space bar pause and... Uh <laughs> the replay speed's adjustable. So if you want to um, hear it in slow motion, just to pick out exactly the right note, or um, if you're transcribing it, um, 
or if you want to, if it's boring and you, you want to get through it faster, you can, <coughs> you can increase. And like M player, that's left and right square bracket. <laughs> So I try to borrow keystrokes from um, uh, other apps as much as I can. Editing, let's go back home, because there is here a flagrant need. Here it sets channel, um, the controller number 91 on channel 9 to 54, but a couple of milliseconds later it, it sets it to 93. That's obviously useless, so we'll delete that one, which is uppercase D. I found I was making, with lowercase D, I found I was many, making too many typos, and that just deletes that file. You, these are displayed incremental times, but often it's of interest to you to see absolute times, um, and you do that with a minus sign, which shows you absolute times. Um, so, uh, oh, um, one second down. So it's all absolute times. And <coughs> to get back to incremental times, of course, it's a plus. <coughs> and you can actually do that while it's playing. Um, so if, it, if it's the question suddenly arises, where am I, <coughs> which can happen, um, then you can use minus at that uh, time, and it will take you straight away into um, um, absolute time mode. After you've deleted, after you've made any edit, um, you uh, and works as undo, um, multiple levels, and <coughs> control R works as redo, just exactly as in Vi. Um, oh yeah, one more cool thing. Uh, well, a couple. So <coughs> you can edit an event in detail with, with um, letter E. And then um, if I can change, well, do something harmless, V changes the volume. And um, you just enter your number. And let's, that will be <coughs> one midi step quieter th uh, than it was, which no one's ever going to hear. Um, and then space takes you back to pause, and you undoes. Ah, I wish it wouldn't do that. Um, it t that's a bug. It takes, it not only undoes, but it also takes you back to where you were bef at the previous um, uh, time it saved the, uh, save the, so the, the thing has been undone, but I'm now catapulted back to it. That's a bug, I'll fix that. <coughs> um, I inserts. Um, same sort of thing, so I can in insert a note or a patch change or a marker or a bank change. We'll, we'll just quit that. Um, this is cool. Um, we can delete a range where you can do lots of things with ranges. So that gets a bit boring, so the, the beginning bit. So we'll um, play, that, uh, uh, play that again and we'll delete half of it. So from this note onwards, we're going to delete that. So we define a range. Uppercase R defines the beginning of the range <coughs> or the end. Uh, it says move to the other end of your range and press uppercase R. So we'll do that. Doesn't matter how you move. Delete up to there. We'll press uppercase R. That's now the other end of our range. And now you can do range operations with lowercase R. And you can do all sorts of things. You can compress or expand, um, delete the whole range. That's what we'll do. You can fade it out, um, <coughs> mix it. I'll explain that sometime. Um, you can change the pitch. In other words, you can take the whole thing up three semitones, take the chorus up two semitones, make it more interesting. Um, 
<coughs> or requantize it, repeat it five times, whatever, change the tempo, um, change the volume, or you can write that range out to a separate little MIDI file. But we'll, we'll just delete that, make it less boring. And um, home, and now this should be a snappier intro for this is for the single, single release version. half the length of the previous intro and the editing is really s smooth if you just pick, pick the right note it's just it's a flawless editing replaces the old razor blade and sticky tape <coughs> and of course W saves the file um, the fact that the W appear here, appears here is a bug um, but it saves the file uh, and Q for quit and you can you can write you can W while you're playing. If it takes your fancy, there is a small delay. <clears throat> then, for, oh, this is the MIDI edit manual page. Same sort of deal. <clears throat> now, for a couple of real-time apps, how, how, how much have we got? Sorry? OK, should be, this is good. A um, couple of. Uh, <coughs> Real-time apps. MIDI Looper is a MIDI loop is good fun. It's um, an Alsa MIDI client, so real-time client, which records and replays loops. Uh, and the user interface, uh, <coughs> the input is only by the uh, I need water. Is only by the notes of the MIDI keyboard. So you. It's, it's set up for live performance situations, and the top note of the keyboard, whatever it is, takes you into sort of command mode, <coughs> and on a MIDI keyboard, or, um, on the M audio stuff anyway, uh, changing channels is done by you press the magic escape key, and then these, there's these row of 16 white notes which are reserved for channels um, which dictate have the numbers 0 to 15 declared on them, and you press one of those, and that takes you to a new channel. So changing channels is extremely quickly or quick on air audio keyboards. So I use those same keys to mean 1 to 16 in the um, uh, controlling um, MIDI loop. The various channels have the same bar length in a given set of loops, like it could be 1.8 seconds, but it can loop each channel can loop over a different number of bars. So you could have the, <coughs> the drummer playing a one bar loop um, and the bass playing a sort of two bar um, uh, loop at the same bar length and the rhythm guitar playing a four bar chord sequence over, over the top of that. And audio loopers by and large can't do that because they don't have a concept of channels. <clears throat> and you can define up to 16 sets of loops. So one set could correspond to the verse and the next, next to the chorus, whatever. And you switch between um, loop sets. That's a dop, 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 dop. Um, that's a pretty quick operation. <clears throat> and the change to the new loop set will, like from the verse to the chorus, whatever, happens at the next bar line. So uh, the performance never loses the beat. Um, there isn't time for the <coughs> demo, and I haven't brought my keyboard anyway because I timed the talk, <coughs> perhaps fortunately. And that's the manual page, same as usual. Kind of de descends from the man format or the Pearl Dot format. <coughs> MIDI chord either adjusts the pitches, well, it adjusts the pitches in some channels so that they don't discord with the pitches in some other channels. So there's the minus A sets the adjust channels and minus F sets the uh, fixed channels. And it works, in fact, either on MIDI files or on real-time MIDI. <coughs> so it can either fit your solo to a pre-existing chord sequence, like a wrong note suppressor, or um, alter the chords uh, to fit your solo, like an auto accompaniment program. 
and the entire motivation of this talk was originally that I should give you at this point a self-indulgent live demo um, of MIDI loop and, um, uh, and a MIDI keyboard feeding through MIDI chord uh, to provide me with an entire auto accompaniment program. So perhaps fortunately there isn't time for that, so we'll skip that demo. This is a photo, oh this is the manual. This is a photo of my setup at home. <coughs> the lower um, keyboard is an M Audio Pro Key Sono 88, which contains its own little um, low tech um, synthesizer, which works really nicely. The output of that goes to the Zoom G3, top left there, um, effects unit, and it then appears out the Yamaha HS5 speaker um, here, bottom right. The upper keyboard is the M Audio. Audio key, key Station 49, there's 49 keys, whose MIDI output goes to this um, uh, laptop um, on the right, whose job it is to run MIDI chord and MIDI loop and things like that. <coughs> of the pedals, the one on the right is the Huawei pedal that controls the zoom, um, and the two on the left are just on-off switches that plug into the the keyboards, one each, and they work by default as their sustain pedals, just like a piano if you saw off two of the pedals. The point of this is that manufacturers make the wrong things. There's a big need for open participation in hardware design. And there's photos here really to illustrate a couple of the needs. Keyboards need more pedal sockets. Every channel has 60 or 70 controllers. There is only one jack socket for a pedal on the back of these keyboards. Two, you know, even a cheap piano has two pe pedals. Um, but no, that's what's called spoiling the ship for a halfpenny worth of um, jack sockets. Also stacking problem. These are particularly good. You should see some of the bad keyboards. Church organs have been stacking keyboards one behind each other for, for centuries. And the ergonomics are, well, no, you, there's no point in waste, don't waste space, you know. You, you don't be forced to play far away from your body. It's just not, it's not good for you. Therefore, there should be no knobs obstructing the top surface of the lower keyboard. And this keyboard is relatively good, but there's still this volume control which gets in the way. Also, the top keyboard should have good undercut under the keys. It should match the width of the, um, the blank panel at the top of the lower keyboard. And that ni neither of them do that. Um, there is, they're making the wrong things, you know. The, uh, I don't know, maybe they don't use their own stuff. There is a need for niche manufacturing project for, for multiple pedal boards, say half a dozen different pedals with some good Raspberry Pi stands out, um, this is a need for a Raspberry Pi, then uh, some kind of user interface like over um, an HTML page which allows you to configure each pedal for a particular pa channel, particular controller. Um, that would be a good niche manufacturing bloke in a shed type project. Lots of people could do that. There's a lot of people out there, way beyond me, who can play bass notes with their feet that um, have the training <coughs> We need good, affordable, 30-note organ, church organ-style pedal boards. There's a lot of people who can play that. It's almost completely unavailable. And it's another good niche manufacturing project. There's also, there's a huge need for better documentation of commercial gear. What's the system command to assign a, a particular pedal to a particular controller or to set the keyboard to a particular channel? It's almost completely undocumented. We could do this. You want, to, want your own guitar, you can make your own guitar, okay? You can't do that with a MIDI keyboard. You need a manufacturer. We could do the changes by organized, crowdsourced lobbying of manufacturers. Um, or someone could set up a small um, a homebrew um, manufacturing garage and buy a 3D printer and try and turn out his own uh, MIDI keyboards. That's more of a challenge. 
but we could do it by organized lobbying of manufacturers. Okay, this is the dreaded bit at the end where I reveal to you the lessons I have learned from life. Oh, well, that's, that's what I've just been through. Um, <clears> the <throat> first is write stuff you actually need and use it yourself. Um, maybe that applies only to Lone Wolf developers, I don't know. <clears throat> Borrow from well-known user interfaces and APIs and keyboard and, and, and command line options because there are users out there. You know, they don't want to have to relearn um, the keystrokes that they've trained, trained themselves in for decades. My favorite nightmare example is the speed adjust keystrokes in M player and uh, CVLC and Xine. They, no commonality at all. I don't know who was first in the market, but the others, they should not have invented something silly. It's already there. There's users out there, millions of them. Um, if you're writing a module, um, <coughs> consider returning your data in a language variable form. So if it's actually a list of things, please return a list. Do not devise a homebrew class, because then you will have to re-implement push and pop and shift and unshift and splice and reverse and map and grep and sort and all the other things you can do with lists. If it's a list, return a list. Be helpful. If you're writing um, high-level language module interfaces to a C library, there's a lot of those, you can usually put in enough glue code in the C to allow your call, calling application to call the C directly. Um, don't do that. Put in a thin, higher-level language in front of the C. That gives you a lot of flexibility for the future. You can add a simple subroutine if you need it. Or check arguments, especially check arguments if they're the wrong type. Then you can raise problems in a language, high-level language appropriate way because the way you complain about a problem in Python is totally different from the way you complain about it in, um, in Lua. And it's all set up for you at the high-level language. There's glue code that exists to do that in C, but it's hard to write very obscure and impossible to translate. Write translatable code. Translate your modules. If what you've written is any use, it will outlast any particular fashionable programming language. I have code that's now in its fifth language. I actually miscounted. It's now in its sixth. <coughs> translatable code. Translation is a wonderful walkthrough for your code, because you actually have to understand what it means, what it does. Uh -huh and you re-express that in the new language. Uh, so it improves quality everywhere. And give your different um, modules compatible calling interfaces uh, across the different languages. Make it easier for your users to translate their code. Also, the big repositories, apparently CPAN now has this. The big repositories need a formal up for adoption process like Debian has. Otherwise, they will rot. There's hundreds and hundreds of developers have, um, are maintaining um, pretty much complete functional modules in all these languages. They're all going to you know, disappear someday. Um, so um, if you've got any influence in a big repository, we need a formal up adoption op process. That was all I was going to say. Um, thank you very much. Introduction for me, for MIDI anyway, and uh, you know, I'm going to go home and bring out all the 8 uh, <coughs> bit MIDI stuff that uh, are on those zip disks and uh, remix them and edit them. Uh, as uh, sorry, give you. Uh,